All right, it's 6.02, we can start. <laughs> Welcome everyone, it's such a pleasure to see you here at the MoMA R&D Salon number 44, proudly number 44. So it's, uh, I'm Paola Antonelli, some of you might know me and some of you might not know me yet. And uh, I, together with Christina Mouchou, run these MoMA R&D Salons. And we want to acknowledge that this is such a difficult, complicated, tragic moment in the history of the world. And us being here hopefully does not take away from the gravity of the situation, but rather maybe help us think uh, deeply about what it means to be humans, what it means to be citizens. Because the reason why we started all these salons is to prove that museums and cultural institutions can be the R&D of society. And as such, they hopefully can help us think. Uh, they will not solve the destinies of the world, of course, but hopefully they will make us more empathetic and uh, just more critical in general. So thank you for being here no matter what, and welcome to this salon about team sports, a salon in which we will discuss many different aspects of team sports. And I have to give you a premise because out of respect for my uh, city of adoption, New York, I will say soccer instead of football. Even though, even though I have to say that it'll hurt every single time. But you know, I just want to be understood. So uh, that said, let's start talking about team sports. Team sports are just mirrors of life. And we talk about team sports all the time. We get reprimanded for not being good team players. We are asked to really take on team spirits. What makes a team? Well, a team is a group of people that has a shared goal. And the goal might be landing a human on the moon or creating the first nuclear bomb. Those of you that have gone to see Oppenheimer know that the Berkeley lab, Lawrence lab, is where uh, it all started. Or it might be playing a wonderful symphony. Or it might be electing Shirley Chisholm for presidential elections. So it really is about pursuing a goal. And in many cases, that goal is athletic. It's the uh, sports as we know it today. And you know, um, individuals and are, are normally uh, on their own when they are at rest, but they come together in teams pretty seamlessly, as was uh, proven by this experiment by Lauren Carpenter, who was one of the founders of Pixar, who at SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH is a super nerdy gathering of techie people, in 91, he left these uh, cards on the seats, and on one side they were red, on the other side they were green, and there was Pong gigantic on the screen, and people could make the paddle go up and down depending on the color they used, and it took them very little to understand how it was working and to organize in teams. So it's almost natural. It's a, it's a natural move like murmurs, like animals organizing teams to pursue a common goal. Well. What happens, though, is that there need to be rules to the game. And these rules are rules that can be sometimes suffocating. But a game is a system in which a player engages in an artificial conflict defined by rules that result in a quantifiable outcome. This is the definition by philosophers Katie Salen, Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman. So there are some rules that are codified, and games become models of human existence, but they're purified. They're kind of like simplified, or at least taken, um, stripped of some of the deepest emotions. And it's important to understand that these rules need to be written. And there are, especially in the end of the 19th and 20th century, that's where most rules were written and most bodies were formed. And it's interesting that it happened exactly at this moment because it's also a moment of expansion of a colonial system that actually was trying to dictate those rules also and that expanded them in a way that was as spread as possible. Bernard Suits, who's also uh, a philosopher, talked about the losery attitude that a player needs to, uh, to take on when he or she enters a game. It's about accepting that you become part of a whole, that there are rules, that there is this uh, uh, need for you to go beyond and stretch beyond your limits to pursue that goal. So there needs to be really a mind frame that becomes absolutely important. And the arbitrary rules have to be uh, observed in this run and a voluntary attempt to overcome 
unnecessary obstacles. So there's also something quite absurd sometimes about games, but in that absurdity lies the challenge of working together. Now, of course, games go back a very, very long time, and they have an interesting relationship with rituals. Claude Lévi-Strauss used to talk about rituals as very unequal kind of situations in which there are some lowlier beings, usually humans, and then there are gods and there are sacrifices that are made to try and find some sort of equality or at least a kind of expiation. And instead, games are about equality and are about trying to instead win over each other, but on equal terms. Interestingly, though, many cultures, especially the Olmec culture that was, you know, Olmec in Nahuatl meant the rubber people, they used to think of rubber and the bounce as a way to actually create a whole cosmology. And so they had all these different courts all over Mexico uh, many, many uh, years ago and millennia ago. And the same with the Mayans. The Mayans actually had a creation story that had a complex uh, coming together of two brothers that were really good at playing ball, and so they created such rockers that the gods were upset with them and blah, blah, blah. It's a complicated story, but that's their mythology of beginning comes with the ball. And actually, the ball game, in a way, is considered to be born in, uh, in those regions and in those kind of cultures. Uh, and of course, you know, the rituals change, and the rituals are also connected to the game, and religion comes as part of the game quite often. I didn't know until Christina did the research for uh, this uh, presentation that there was such a thing as muscular Christianity. Actually, it was a movement in, the United, in, the, in Great Britain in the 19th century, and it was kind of going back to ancient Greece and to the idea of this like uh, beautiful human and usually male bodies that equated, and then was reprised by the Renaissance, that equated physical integrity with moral integrity and became almost a way to create all these warriors that from the UK would go and colonize the whole world because of the power of their prowess. So uh, even in this case, there is this kind of religious crusade like uh, uh, charge in the sports. And that was completely thrown uh, for a, a lap by what happened in Trobriand. So in Papua New Guinea, uh, cricket was, as was in much Southeast Asia and, and South Asia, the sports of colonial choice. And it was assumed pretty much everywhere following the rules that were prescribed by the UK, by the British colonizers, except for this particular island, Trobriand Island, where the locals instead infused the game of cricket with their own rituals and with their own dances and chants. And it became this kind of completely absorbed and internalized non-colonial response to the UK imperialism. So it's interesting to see also how games are exported, that they are at times soft power, and in the worst of cases, colonial imperialism. Similarly, with this idea of muscular Christianity is also the myth of the machine, and the fact that in many cases, the uh, idea of sports, of modern sports, was going at the same time with the idea of mechanization takes command. Those of you that are experts in architecture and design might recognize uh, Siegfried Gideon and the whole idea of thinking of the myth of the machine for architecture and for design. So it's at the beginning of the century, of the 20th century, that the first diagrams and this idea of mechanization, of the position of each player in the whole game, of, of uh, ways in which the whole game must be quantified and resolved are diffused in the world. And it really makes us think of the industrial mechanization and of the place that everybody had in the chain of production of labor. At the same time, there's also this attempt to quantify. You know, uh, you heard before from you know Katie Salen's quote that there needs to be some kind of quantifiable goal at the end. How many sco well, the score or anyway uh, some sort of quantifiable outcome. And it's in the uh, at the beginning of the 20th century and throughout the century that scores start to be measured and taken. You see here Babe Ruth's batting record. I mean, it really becomes something that 
deals also with mathematics. So more and more, it's about measurement, it's about positioning the team, it's about calculating, and we're not yet talking about the, the part that is truly about capitalism and the fact that games have become also enormous businesses. And that teams suffer from that sometimes, uh, especially when players are uh, moved around often and gingerly. The, um, the, the gaze of artists looks at games in this kind of polyhedric and multidimensional way. Harun Faraki here talked about the win in 2006, where I don't want to say anything wrong. I think it was, yeah, when France and Italy final, yeah, at the football World Cup, soccer World Cup, right? So, um, yeah, I remember sad. Anyway, um, <laughs> yeah, and I know, I remember 1992, 1982, yeah, I remember that one was epic. Anyway, um, so in, uh, Faraki tried to have all the different viewpoints that are possible when it comes to the game of soccer, right? So he was looking at it from the fans' viewpoint, from the ball's viewpoint, from the player's viewpoint, from the TV watcher viewpoint. And the truth is that, especially when it comes to such an amazingly popular game as soccer, the team that plays is only one team. Teams are whole nations, cities, the whole world. So the team expands. The team is almost infective, you know, infectious. And uh, this particular work, if you've never seen, really shows you how many ways there are to consider sports, especially such a sport as soccer. Here's when the Argentine soccer team <laughs> won last year. You know, I mean, it becomes really something that is so beyond anything that happens on the field itself. So teams really have a way to uh, work beyond the limits of their, uh, their own sports. Teams are also politics. You know, there's a lot of politics in games. And this is a picture from an exhibition that I curated a few years ago here at MoMA that was called Items and was about the items of clothing that had an impact on the world in the 20th or so century on the New York-based world. Is there any other? Anyway, so uh, this lineup of jerseys here is politically significant. So we have, on the one hand, Pelé, of course, the dream that opened the dreams of so many kids in the world. You know, that's why every kid in every favela, in every shanty town, in every outskirts of the world wants to play because there's the sense, Maradona did the same, but there's the sense of the possibility of so many possibilities that are open by being a sports person. Michael Jordan, of course, a role model for so many kids, but somebody that did not speak out ever in an open way, he just ruled by example and he changed the world by example. Kaepernick, not the same. He took the knee and was in a way completely blackballed by the NFL. And then the Black Ferns of New Zealand, the women rugby team that you saw doing the hack at the beginning, that were that are just like amazing warriors, but were there in this enfilado jersey to talk jerseys to talk about the disparity in pay and in recognition between women and men. So if you look at this, then you can think of the reverberations in the world. You know, these athletes are heroes. They are role models. They stand bright and they show the people of the world what they can do. For Pelé, we were discussing before uh, the fact that soccer uh, is such a powerful way to think of the, a future. Same with cricket. These are kids playing cricket in India. This is outdoor uh, baseball. I'm sorry, basketball. Sorry, Bobito. I know you're there. <laughs> Apologies. Yeah, yeah. And here is instead a more overt political gesture that athletes sometimes take. Of course, 1968, I'm departing for a moment from our ball sports to just take a bow and, uh, in, and, uh, and really um, celebrate the, to, the 1968 Summer Olympics in which Tommy Smith and John Carlos did you know, ra raise their fist. And of course, this is the cape, cap, and uh, Eric Reed in, uh, in 2016. 
um, politics goes beyond the field, of course. And even though you might think that I'm talking about Megan Rapinoe here because of her spats with uh, Trump. I mean, it was really interesting in 2019 when she, using a lot of ex expletives, decided not to go to the to the White House. And then, you know, uh, recently Trump rejoiced when the uh, U.S. female soccer team was eliminated from the World Cup. Instead, we have her here with Joe Biden and with Jill Biden talking about um, proclamating March 24th as the National Equal Pay Day, you know, so talking about this disparity between women and men. And this is a gorgeous picture by Catherine Opie that in a way talks about what uh, masculinity or in any way gender identity has become. Compare it with the uh, muscular Christianity and see how subtle and delicate things have become and how different they are. Um, is there a moral reason to keep gender segregated or is it just a physical reason? You know, we've had so many discussions about trans athletes, for instance, and it's only the beginning of all these discussions. Um, and, you know, there was that beautiful 1980, Throw It Like a Girl, you know, that beautiful book that argued that only until bodies, and especially female bodies, will not be considered objects anymore, only then will we be able to have some parity. But you know what? It's, there's still a lot of work to do, and I'm very glad that today we will have a chance to discuss it. Uh, what team do we want? You know, what is the ideal team in the end? Is it like a league of their own, or is it Ted Lasso, or is it Friday Night Lights, which was my introduction to, I, I, I watched all the seasons because I was supposed to go to Austin for a conference, and I, I'm like, what do I care about? American football, teenage boys, and a little town in Texas, and I was riveted. I watched all the seven seasons, or Hoop Dreams, right? So. What team do we have in mind? And then, you know, if you're from another part of the world, you might have other ideas. No matter what, we have our own team. I'm sure that you have a team in your heart, and it's a team that you might think of when you have to perform in your everyday life, and you have to think of how to work with others towards a common goal. So today, to talk about all this, we have a fabulous set of speakers. So in alphabetical order, we have anthropologist Tracy Canada, we have Philosopher Simon Critchley, woo, yeah. Then we have designer Gabrielle Fontana. We have superstar radio host, uh, basketball um, aficionado, and what more, Bobito Garcia, who's going to be like the Wizard of Oz on the screen. And then we have Colette V. Smith, who is the first black female uh, coach of the NFL in NFL's history and the first female coach for the New York Jets. And also she was a football player herself. In the middle of their presentations, there will be some videos that have been done by all these different wonderful individuals whose uh, credentials you will see when they will appear on the screen that have been done to contribute and to kind of round out our conversation. And we're going to start, actually, with the first video. And then after that, we will have Bobito on the screen. So please, let's start with the first video that is going to be, ooh, I can't remember. <laughs> Surprise. Oh, Carling Wing, that's right. I'm interested in the way games, especially when they are formalized and institutionalized into sports, contain material histories and model worldviews. And I'm particularly interested in ball games because I think of bounce as a special kind of interaction and balls as special kinds of objects for creating collectives. Michel Serre uses the ball to illustrate his concept of the quasi-object, an object that only becomes itself when a subject is holding it, and in turn marks a subject as a subject, as an I. The idea here is that as a ball is passed or thrown or kicked or bounced around, it's the I itself that is passed around and that it is through this passing that a we is formed. So a question then is how does what a ball is made of, how it is made, where it is made, how it bounces and what the conditions are for this bounce impact the kinds of eyes and we's that are created. So here are two very quick examples from the history of rubber bounce. The game of ulama was developed by the Olmec over 3,000 years ago in step with their development of the first known rubber technologies. And variations have been played 
almost continuously on this continent ever since. It's played with a solid rubber ball that usually weighs between seven to nine pounds. And a single ulama ball can last for years, becoming smoother and more regular over time and through play. In contrast, the game of tennis switched to using hollow pressurized rubber balls in the late 19th century, in step with the vulcanization and industrialization of colonial rubber. These balls begin to lose their bounce the minute they're taken from the can. A tennis ball takes about 400 years to decompose in a landfill and the US Open tournament in New York uses 90,000 balls every year. Um, so I hope these very quick sketches begin to point to how subjectivity does not simply circulate between players on a given team or even teams on a given field, but rather that the collectives being shaped through the play of team sports always also include many disparate and distant bodies, architectures, environments, and landscapes. And now we're gonna have Bobito coming on the screen. Bobito, where are you? What up? Oh, what up? Here you are. So glad to have you, my dear. Yay, there you go. <laughs> What's happening to everybody? Peace. Salute. My mind is blown right now. I, I, I'm, I'm absorbing so much history and facts and just the nerd in me. It's just, it's, uh, let's go. Can I just start talking or we got questions? Go for, for it. No, no, you go. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome everybody. Bienvenidos. Uh, Salam Aleikum. My name is Bapito Garcia. Uh, I have been asked to speak about team sports in the, in the sphere of basketball. I want to start out uh, taking uh, a little pass from Paola regarding the muscular uh, Christianity because the inventor of the sport on December 21st, 1891, Dr. James Naismith, who was from Canada, actually had a vision of muscular spirituality, of course, within the Christian context, but I think for all of us globally who play it, we sort of attach ourselves to this soul um, that is very uplifting and 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 it starts from day one. His vision also was to provide an alternative to sports that his students were playing at the at the YMCA in Springfield, Massachusetts, where they were rough with each other. And some of the the um the adults were not being engaged in positive activities outside of the YMCA where they were as well. So his whole goal was to provide an alternative that was going to be safe, active, and have a spiritual aspect to it. And the interesting thing about Dr. James Naismith is that years later, he once said that I did not invent this sport to be coached. I invented it to be played. And so to play on another point that Paola made, Basketball has become a huge, huge behemoth of, of, a, of a topic for media, um, for entrepreneurs who, who uh, you know, have franchises and, uh, I mean, it's part of the Olympics, it's, it's global. In China, 20 years ago, they had 315 million registered ballplayers. It's more than the United States population. So, and the game hasn't even peaked. So going back to the early 1900s, as Jewish immigrants were arriving uh, in New York City from Europe, as well as African-American, African-Caribbean uh, um, uh, population groups in Harlem and Chelsea, they all started taking to this game basketball and it was a beautiful, beautiful movement, even that early on. And it was really fulfilling Dr. James Naismith's vision in that people were being engaged and were playing a, a game that was a positive activity. And, and the, New York, the New York City government sort of recognized that. So in the 1930s under Robert Moses, they spent a lot of money to fund building hundreds of courts throughout the five boroughs. And in doing so, 
the 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 sport just naturally spread. I mean, the the uh, the passion for it was already there, but when you have passion as well as a resource, then it has the the seeds to grow. In 1950, um, there was a Harlem educator named Holcomb Rucker. Uh, in 1946 to be exact, who created the very first outdoor tournament for youth. And he started that. And as it grew and he added college and pro divisions, it really became one of the uh, biggest motivators for the sport that the city ever knew. Because all of a sudden he had the greatest ball players in the world, Will Chamberlain, Connie Hawkins, Cal Ramsey, Tom Sanders, et cetera, et cetera. Players that you may have heard of, players that you haven't. But they were playing outdoors for free. And what that did was inspire children, youth, adults, senior citizens to go out and play. Because ultimately the bottom line is that when basketball is played outdoors, whether it's a, whether in a team context or as an individual, it is an open and free space. And it is the very core of what our beautiful city represents in its best aspects. Um, as New York has been a leader when it comes to culture, when it comes to fashion, um, and how basketball has influenced um, other sports and other industries, um, whether it be sneakers or whether it be uh, streetwear or whether it be even the NBA, um, a lot of uh, corporations and ad agencies have taken their cues from what happens on the playground. So it's a very, very powerful movement and it spans over decades and decades and decades. There's so much history to it. But personally, the reason why I feel it's so important and so vital as a tool for social change because I cannot go to the New York Athletic Club on 57th Street and play unless I'm a member. I cannot go to NYU Cole Center and enter and play. I cannot go to the Levy and Gym at Columbia University and just play. All of these require that I'm matriculating at an institution or that I'm a member of a, of a special club that costs money. The outdoor court, on the other hand, is if basketball is a, uh, is a religion, the park is my church. And in this way, it connects again to the most muscular spirituality that Dr. Na Dr. James Naismith invented this, this sport for, and to begin with. Um, and there's a specific moment for me uh, when I was living in the LES and I would go to Tompkins, Tompkins Square Park. And I'll never forget this. We had a five on five game. One player was a reverend. One player was an NYU student. One player was a writer who went, who went on to win plenty of awards and be uh, heralded by the New York Times. Um, there was one person who was unhoused. I don't know the religious backgrounds of everybody on that court, but I can tell you that I would imagine that there were at least three of the five biggest religions in the, in the world represented on that court that day. Where else can we find that mixture of people so seamlessly and, and, and engaged in physical activity? So it's, and, and the, the other beauty of the of basketball and in the, in the context where it's outside and it's pickup and that there's no coaches, there's no referees. And Paolo showed all those beautiful archival uh, ephemera of rules, but there's no rules outside in the park either. There's unwritten rules and there's unwritten codes, but essentially there's, there's 10 people deciding on, well, what's the, what's the, what's the game gonna go to? How are we gonna win this game? We don't even know each other. We're not calling any plays. And so it creates this spontaneity and this togetherness with, and then you add in the diversity and what you have is something that's really unparalleled in our society. Well, I, I'm sorry, 
football, not not American football, I'm talking about global football, <laughs> is similar in that it has the pickup aspect, it has players that may not know each other or may know each other, and and who combine their energies and their forces and their and their predisposed knowledge of the game to attempt to win. But the bottom line is that it really doesn't matter who wins or loses. So everybody wins by participating. And it's something that I've tried to really advocate on a global level um, with my various projects, whether they've been my books, films, magazines, uh, my clinics, my tournament, you know, uh, my photography, which you're seeing on screen. But ultimately, uh, I, I am thankful personally that I have been a contributor and just a humble member of the New York City basketball community since 1973. Um, and I can't, I can't think of any other, not going to Wesleyan University, not working in the industry for multiple record labels. There's nothing that has shaped my life more than be simply being at the park playing basketball it is it is at my like it's it's my heart it's if i cut myself by accident i'm probably going to have like a basketball pop out of my vein <laughs> it's just well, I, don't, I can't even tell you how much i mean here's another example uh in 2020 when the pandemic started and there were stay at home orders and people were being asked to mask up to, to mitigate risks. I lived in Crown Heights at the time in Brooklyn and people were not stopping playing ball. Yeah, they took down the basketball. So the point where the New yeah. York City Parks and Recreation Department and D took down the rims to try to mitigate risks. And had they not, people would not have stopped playing. It was and everybody most, knew what the basketballs that were still up were. They were like, you know, this tam tam, and people were telling each other where they could still find some basketballs up. I remember there was one on Barrick, <laughs> Hudson, actually. Anyway, this is so beautiful, Bobito. So stay with us so we can ask you about the code, because uh, it's beautiful to see teams coming together so seamlessly. But I think you can debunk for us and decode for us behaviors that are deeply set in humans. So. Thank you for this great presentation. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Stay with us, huh? <laughs> and now we have a video by Sergio Galas Garcia. Oh, not again. I wish I had the video of the hacker while we wait for the other video. <laughs> oh, here it comes. Great. So I would begin to say that the main goal of the basket court in uh, the territory we know now as Mexico is the same as in any other place, which is uh, allow to allow basketball to happen, you know, by providing a surface against which a uh, ball can be dribbled uh, and eventually, you know, reach a basket up in the air. <laughs> but in many places across Mexico, especially in the rural lands sprinkled across the country's southern highlands in Oaxaca and Guerrero states, Communities have given basketball courts a way more open vocation. People have leveraged uh, three characteristics of basketball courts to turn them into intense sites of programmatic reappropriation. Due to at least three conditions. The most basic one is, of course, their flatness, uh, which is a pre precious topographic resource in places where steepness is the norm. A second one is their political neutrality. Indeed, unlike standard flat open spaces in many small communities in Mexico, the court does not include a monument exerting symbolic tutelage 
over the, over the land it is embedded in. And the final and third one is their tectonic potential. The two basket poles at both extremes of the court allow uh, people to tie knots, to connect ropes, to support temporary ceilings, and to engage in three-dimensional design practices. Due to these uh, features, towns in the Mihi and Mixtec lands, among others, have uh, turned basketball courts into fertile soils to grow a profusion of multiple social uses. The court may be a market, a town hall, a children's playground, a place for teenage flirtation, a place for well or badly intended gossip, a place for basketball, for soccer, for voting, for appointing local authorities, for taking the sun, or for being protected from the sun. By allowing this, di this diversity of programs to mushroom, the basketball court has been hacked to become a space for pragmatic imagination, for social negotiation, and for community initiation. It's become a piazza, basically. Well, I would like now to call Tracy Canada, cultural anthropologist from Duke University, affiliated with the program in race and sports. Sports and race, yeah. actually. <laughs> yeah. I'll take it. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Thanks for being here, y'all. Um, I'm going to read to keep to the time, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation after. Um, in May of this year, Michael Van Buren, a highly recruited quarterback from the class of 2024, announced where he would play in college. Amidst offers from schools like Alabama, Michigan, and Miami, University of Oregon beat out the others. Speaking to ESPN, Van Buren outlined why he chose Oregon. What stood out to me most would probably be just how bought in everybody is and how together everybody is. The team is very close. Everybody treats everybody like family. I'm not surprised by Van Buren's comments. I am skeptical, though. As an anthropologist and ethnographer, I've spent the last decade learning from black college football players to better understand how they navigate their everyday lives, particularly their college football programs. Van Buren saw what Oregon football wanted him to see. Coaches, administrators, academic advisors, equipment managers, athletic trainers are all invested in building a tight, cohesive collective of individuals through the team. They're all working to promote the success on the playing field. At Mellon University, a pseudonym from where I spent time during a year of research, the team came to life through a hashtag that was constantly repeated. Hashtag Mellon Crew was on the back of team distributed shirts that players must wear, printed on plastic wristbands and in brochures, and uploaded with coaches' social media posts that forever live on the internet. The hashtag is an attempt to convey that despite football-related differences, like playing positions and scholarship status, or race and class background differences, these no longer matter when one becomes a Mellon teammate. It's an almost compulsory sense of group identity, and it's meant to invoke the tonality of care, trust, and solidarity within the group of players. Once a teammate, the player is no longer an individual, but is instead a member of the Mellon football team, someone who represents the coaches, the staff, the athletic program, and the university. It's easy to see just how prominently programs use the tactic. A quick search of social media finds plenty of examples. These kinds of mottos have infiltrated the space, and you'll notice they all infer a certain kind of relationship. Football coaches and staff rely upon narratives like hashtag Mellon Crew to infuse the team with the language and morality of family. So much energy is put into convincing teammates they belong to the football family, and on some level, the attempt is successful. The team, after all, is the most recognized representation of community and family in sport, and we'll hear all about it today, right? Ideally, the team becomes a football family through their athletic labor, and players are meant to come together for the greater good of the family. This strategy is what Van Buren was reacting to, but the rhetoric is insincere. Sociologist Aaron Hatton writes that the commodification of college athletes is exaggerated by this constant emphasis on care and family, given players' uncompensated labor powers the entire system. Insights from my own research help to explain why. In this world of play, individual football players come to matter for the good of the team because of the intense focus on their laboring bodies and the ability to extract a player's a productive value on the field, excuse me. Football programs only want to win games, garner revenue, and secure prestige, so the desire to win is never far from any administrative action. Programs merely see and use athletic bodies as commodities and invest in these bodies only to keep them healthy and interested enough to play. Instead of investing in the well-being of the person, football families are concerned with the athletic ability of the player. 
It's a form of objectification the black feminist theorist Bell Hooks argues calls to mind the history of slavery and the plantation economy. And she actually said that about hope dreams, which is something that you pointed out at the beginning. A comparison that holds when considering the demographics of the team. American football is riddled with examples of how this exploitative narrative of a caring football family crumbles under pressure. Some college players were expected to play in front of empty stadiums that were filled with media cameras at the height of the pandemic during the 2020 season. A group of players who opted out were featured in Sports Illustrated. By sitting out, they weren't applauded for avoiding risk of illness and injury. Instead, their decision was framed as abandoning their college teams, which then cast doubt on their commitment to a potential NFL team. Thus, players were expected to prioritize their, quote, football family over any concern for personal health, well-being, and future prospects. And we can't forget that the same narrative was used to get, um, to get essential workers back to work um, because there were very little protections in place for them as well, right? So I would argue that they're essential workers too. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, there are plenty of convincing stories to disprove the authenticity of the football family. But this rhetoric becomes even more insincere when we consider that popular narratives about teams and teammates and football families often promote a post-racial narrative. They effectively gloss over the importance of the racialized positionalities of the players themselves. For this reason, the team is complicated when considering the experiences of black players. Black men are overrepresented on the football field and underrepresented in positions of power. And we can see here from stats that are a couple of years old now, but they pretty much stay consistent, that black men are about 50% of the players, but less than 10% of administrators. These demographics show that the team is a top-down idea encouraged by, primarily by white male football coaches and administrators. These uncompensated athletes are the ones who experience physical harm while participating in an inherently violent sport. However, the value they produce from their labor is transferred away to coaches, administrators, institutions, and media conglomerates who make a lot of money while claiming to care about their well-being. College football is a billion-dollar industry, after all. So you guessed it. I think Van Buren's opinion of Oregon football will change over time. I've learned that despite the team, black players find their own ways to create, navigate, and maintain meaningful relationships. I call this alternative the football brotherhood because it's the language that black players <coughs> provided me while I spent time with them. They're brothers. There's a difference between football teammates and football brothers. The latter refers to the racialized and gendered experiences that bond the young black men who end up on college teams together. Over time, they choose to become brothers as a reaction to the anti-black systems that surround them both on and off the field. Black athletes relate to and care for others who share this embodied experience. Black players act out this brotherhood in ordinary moments. While there are several, the way they commonly invoke an us versus them narrative to distinguish different folks on the team is a prime example of this racialized separation. No matter how it's shown, this brotherhood marks both resistance and community as players tackle the anti-black environment that populates their social worlds. In the shadow of the actions of those manipulating the team, black players have agency in the transition from teammate to brother. They're compelled by a form of care for each other that's predicated on a concern for a young man who takes the field and lives a life beyond it. That's why I'll be interested to learn if and how Michael Van Buren's perception of his new football team changes over time. Once he's a duck, he might wear the paraphernalia and post the hashtags online and repeat the narratives to the media. But I imagine he'll soon prioritize the football brotherhood over the Oregon team, despite the best attempts to portray a convincing football family. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tracy. Uh, by the way, um, Bell Hook's review of Hoop Dreams. Hoop Dreams is in your reading list, as are pieces by Tracy and um, films by Bobito. So refer to that afterwards for everything that you've heard today. And now there are two videos by Ben Carrington and Brenda Elsie. Team sports, or esprit de corps, as the French might put it, quite literally the spirit of the body. It invokes and implies a sense of bonding, camaraderie, team spirit. Sports are, if anything, about the human body in motion. But what happens when that human body in motion isn't an individual, but is a collective, is a team in movement? My football team, Liverpool FC, has a famous song which is titled, <laughs> You'll Never Walk Alone. And in that, 
title in that song. I think it's an important idea that individual freedom, safety, creativity is made all the more possible and all the more stronger once we are part of a collective. And I think it's for that reason that historically and across time at certain moments, team sports have come to embody wider struggles for freedom. Think, for example, the importance of the Negro Leagues in baseball in African American communities, or perhaps even the West Indies cricket team embodying a sense of West Indian pride and independence, or maybe even the Brazilian football team, and figured by a player like Pelé. At times, sports can be a vehicle for racial pride and uplift, but sports can also be a space for racial exclusion. Sometimes sports have signified not black excellence and black creativity, but forms of anti-black racism. I think this is one of the lessons we should take away, is that sports has no inherent moral value. It is neither good nor bad, positive nor negative. It has those values depending on how we play sports, how we organise sports, and the values that we give to sports. Sports can be a vehicle that reproduces racist ideas, but it can at times also prefigure a post-racial future. It can offer, offer us a glimpse of what a post-racial society might look like, only if we're willing to fight for it. Since modern sports, as we think of them, regulated sports began in the 19th century in Latin America, uh, women have been playing them, and the very fact that they're playing them challenges societal norms, and they've done that both formally and informally. So in the case of Brazil, for example, where football or soccer, as we call it in the U.S., um, was banned for women, women petitioned the government between 1941-1981 when um, that ban was finally lifted. They challenged it informally by playing anywhere, in birthday parties, beaches, and teens. They even appeared in stadiums to the point where um, certain regional governors were complaining um, to the state that they needed more help in disciplining women that were trying to play. The idea that women deserve uh, free time, that they deserve physical liberty, that they enjoy and find pleasure in exerting their bodies and acting as teammates to one another, all of those challenge societal norms. There were quite a lot of scientists that even knowing that the science wasn't there, were willing to put their names on different pieces of formal medical advice that said that sports were bad for women or too violent or harmed their maternal health. Those scientists um, that circulated that information created societal norms throughout Latin America that women had to challenge. The idea in Mexico that women professionals, and, and this includes tennis players and soccer players and women's basketball, which emerged in, in Mexico in the 1920s, all of those activities challenged the idea both that the scientists had it right, but also that even if they had it right, that their sole purpose in life was not to uh, only be a maternal vehicle. I would like now to invite to the podium Simon Critchley, who is the Hans Jonas Professor of Philosophy at the New School, who among you know, ethics, political theory, and continental philosophy also penned a book called What We Think About When We Think About Football. Thank you, Simon. Carlo. <laughs> um, being a team, being in a team, loving and supporting a team is ultimately about seeing the world sub specie ludi under the aspect of play. The world is a world of play, serious play, deep play. I could say a lot more about this, but you saw that Haran Faroqi uh, artwork installation called Deep Play, which is the same title as Clifford Geertz's essay on the Balinese cockfight, Deep Play. If you want to understand a social structure, you look at the way it plays deeply. Play is not shallow and unserious. Play is deep. Play, and especially team play, is what is deepest about human life. The way that play takes on enduring form 
in social life, when humans live together in groups, the way play takes on form, enduring form, is, as Paolo said at the beginning, in ritual. Ritual is interesting. Ritual is seriousness at its highest, a funeral, say, or a wedding. And it's play. If ritual is both serious and playful, then we have to rethink the opposition between seriousness and play. Play and team play is what human beings do. And it defines what they think of, Bobito mentioned this uh, earlier, what they think of as sacred, what they think of as sacred. And the sacred is always playful. <coughs> and this is the core of religious life. Right? Religious life is a network of rituals, which is serious, deep play. And this is why for people that really care about teams, ultimately, it's a question of faith. I share the same conviction with the same badge, Liverpool Football Club. <laughs> Our famous manager, my, yeah, it's everything to me. Our legendary team coach, Bill Shankly, said in the 1960s, football is not a matter of life and death. It is much more important than that. <laughs> So thank you to, that's my conclusion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you to Christina Michoud and thanks to Paulia Antonelli from Milan. Yeah. This could be a talk about the team, the soccer team, the football team. Uh, the name of the game is association football. Association football, from which we derive the term soccer. No it's way. an abbreviation. It's not an Americanism. When I was a kid, we talked about soccer Ooh. and football. So that's a strange thing that's crept up in the last generation. The football team, soccer team, that was, is or was AC Milan, especially when Milan did what they did when Arrigo Sacchi was the coach yeah. between 1987 and 1991, and Silvio Berlusconi. Sorry was the owner. <laughs> and there, in a sense, is the whole problem of team play. Arrigo Sacchi, team sports, and Silvio Berlusconi, the money. Um, Sacchi broke with the, determ the domination of what was called in Italian football catenaccio, the closed bolt Italian defensive style. And he introduced a version of Dutch football, actually, earlier it was a Hungarian style of football. Actually, that was what was adapted in South America. Uh, Brazilian, Argentinian football, total football, where every team player can play in every position. Arrigo Saki was a former shoe salesman with no history as a player. Do you need to be a player in order to be a coach? He was repeatedly asked. And he answered, do you need to have been a horse in order to be a jockey? He built something unique and powerful at Milan. This was soccer based on position, on team position, on controlling space, collective movement, a team moving in unison. It's what Pep Guardiola, the greatest team coach in the world at present, calls juego de posición, the game of position. And the team has to be what Saki called the short team. Not short guys. <laughs> but a short team in the sense in which the space between the most defensive player and the most attacking player for Saki could not be more than 25 meters. So you compress space and then you flood that space with your players and you dominate the play space. Milan. <laughs> Sorry about that, I couldn't resist. Milan. It's called Milan. It's an Anglicism. It's not Milano, but Milan. Football teams in the late 19th century, early 20th century, very often had English names. Genoa instead of Genova. River Plate instead of Rio de la Plata in Argentina and again in Uruguay. Not to mention 
Newell's Young Boys, which is where Lionel Messi began his career in Rosario, Argentina. And football was introduced to Italy from Switzerland. It's true. By Swiss businessmen with English connections. FC Barcelona was founded by a Swiss businessman. Hans Marx Gamper in 1899. Is that colonial and capitalist? Well, yeah. We can think about that. AC Milan were founded by, in 1899 by an Englishman, Herbert Kilpin, as the Milan Football and Cricket Club, I think. It was forced to change its name to Milano under Mussolini. The first clubs in Spain, Athletic Club Bilbao, and then Athletic Club Madrid, Athletic, Atletico Madrid only became Atletico under Franco. So there's a more complex history to tell here. Um, there are all these questions which were asked, and I'll, I'm going to be very, very brief. I've got lots and lots to say. I don't see football, soccer as a sport. That's the problem. I see it as a as theatre, as a drama where, where fate, the heavy weight of the past, plays out interspersed with chance in often devastating ways. Let me finish them. So the focus has to be on the team. And there are huge problems. The huge problem in football, soccer, is the contradiction between the form of the game, which is association football, and you can go from association quite easily, a lot of coaches have, to socialism. Right? There are coaches like Bill Shankly of Liverpool Football Club, Brian Clough, many others, Italy, elsewhere. The socialism of collaborative play as the form of the game, but the content of the game is money. And how do you square that contradiction? Well, you can't. It's just a contradiction that is lived, and it's lived in different ways. Last thing I want to say. I was asked about a question about um, the uh, football and identity, basically, we could say. On my grandmother's grave, uh, I didn't call her my grandmother, she was my nan. On my nan's grave, there's a Liverpool club crest. She was buried in 2001. It didn't cross our mind that was anything strange. About 10 years later, I photographed that. To, I photographed that, and I sent the photograph to somebody. And they said, that's the Liverpool badge on. Well, of course it is. I mean, she's not going to put an Everton badge on there or Manchester United. It's a Liverpool badge. So we talked about the game, me and my nan. My father went to the games from the 1950s onwards. He programmed me to support Liverpool. I programmed my son, who's 31 years old and living happily in South London, to support the team. What meaning does one's life have? I mean, we're going to die and probably be forgotten, right? Uh, what actually lived, what sense does a lived memory have? Well, in that little narrative that I can tell, there's 100 years of fandom in relationship to one team. And it's not about players. It's not about individuals, it's about the team. The team as an idea, a complex, messy idea. But a team, an idea that should be celebrated, who never walk alone. God bless you all, good night. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'm, very, I'm very touched. I'm very touched by your analysis of Milanese. And I have to say that contrary to you, I went against my father, who was for Inter Milan, actually. So, you know, the dynamics of family. It's, but it was beautiful. Thank you so much. And now two videos, Maggie Popkin and Sayuri Gatri Shimizu. I'm an art historian who studies the Roman Empire, where popular sports such as gladiatorial combat definitely relied on the production and consumption of a shared visual and material culture. If you were a Roman, you could own various kinds of sports merchandise, like this pocket knife with a handle in the form of your favorite kind of gladiator. These things allowed people living all around the Roman Empire to participate vicariously in popular sports, even if they couldn't go to games in person. On one hand, affordable objects like this knife allowed people to imagine affinities with other fans around the empire. 
On the other hand, Roman sports merchandise literally objectified athletes, commodifying and exploiting their bodies for profit outside the arena. A gladiator knife allowed a manufacturer to make money off the body of the gladiator, and it allowed the knife's owner to use the gladiator's body as an instrument, as a tool. Each time the owner folded the blade into the gladiator, they were able to dominate the athlete's body in a small, intimate act of violence that undercut the social status of gladiators. The material culture of Roman sport lays bare the extreme power differentials that existed between athletes like gladiators, many of whom were enslaved, and the socioeconomically better off Romans who could make money from or own drinking cups, pocket knives, and oil lamps with the image of athletes. Thinking about the ancient Roman material has made me question the ethical cost of remediating athletes' bodies today as objects of sports merchandise which do allow us to perform fandom beyond ephemeral sports events. But they also commodify athletes. We can buy t-shirts and hats with professional athletes' images, keychains, even dog chew toys in the shape of athletes. As in Rome, these things instrumentalize athletes. Athletes can profit from their sale, but sports merchandise still positions athletes as objects for consumption by others. So ultimately, I don't think we can fully understand the paradoxically inclusive and exploitative power of team sports today and throughout history without thinking seriously about the related objects that permeate people's daily lives. Baseball came to Japan in the 1870s at the time, Japan had just come out of a 250-year-long diplomatic isolation and was rapidly modernizing and westernizing. A group of young American men hired by the Japanese government as teachers and engineers introduced the game of baseball to elite Japanese students. That's how it all started. The love of the game spread across Japan over the next few decades, and by the early 20th century, Baseball had become an integral part of Japan's school athletic programs and student culture in general. It also became by far the most popular team sports in Japan, and I think it still is. Baseball became an important cultural connective tissue in U.S.-Japanese relations as well. A vibrant exchange in college and amateur baseball began in the early 20th century. Japanese-American teams toward their ancestral land, Japan, and stirred up Japan's diasporic imaginations. Baseball was so eagerly embraced by the Japanese because it required teamwork while simultaneously providing space for showcasing individual excellence. This dual attribute of baseball as a team sport resonated with the ethos of the rapidly industrializing and modernizing society that was Japan. Through Japan's modern history, baseball players also embodied an idealized male citizen striving for his individual achievement, while at the same time, supremely dedicated to the glory of his team. I would like now to call to the podium Colette V. Smith. I've already told you about her breaking records as a coach and also about her being a player, but she also found it since Believe in You, which is an association that promotes empowerment among young African-American women throughout the country. So Colette V. Smith. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> ah, boy, I tell you. So first of all, it's an honor to be here. Uh, my mom brought me here as a kid. Uh, this was a space that we weren't really welcome in when I was growing up. Uh, so to be here on a different spectrum is quite amazing. Um, one of our greatest world leaders, um, the great Nelson Mandela, said that sports is the great uniter, which is true. As a woman, as a girl growing up loving football, it was the great divider in my brain. And then, you know, when I think about Mike Ditka, one of the greatest football coaches to ever exist in this universe, he said, you're never a loser until you quit trying. Right, so as a young girl that uh, played football in my brain, 
<laughs> because I wasn't allowed to play football on any capacity and organize positions because I was a girl by all means. So girls don't play football. How dare you? The audacity of you to think you even want to play, let alone like the sport. So that dream was ripped away from me at a, quite an early age. And uh, I still played in the uh, football in the streets with the boys. However, um, when I got older, football was completely taken away from me. And when you think about what team sports has the capacity to do for a child, especially a child growing up in the inner city, especially a child that grows up without a mother and a father that doesn't have that CEO position or that college degree or even a high school degree. Sports has a great way to teach you so many life lessons off the field. So a lot of folks, myself included, were not allowed to have that. So it wasn't until the age of 42 years that I got to play football and on a professional level with a women's pro football team. And as I sat home smoking a cigarette, drinking in, you know, a beer, and I happened to run across football tryouts, I thought, I'm going to try out because I wasn't allowed to do this when I was younger, so how dare me stop myself from doing this today? I looked hard for every excuse not to go to those tryouts. Not because I didn't want to be there, but because it wasn't a part of my life anymore. My life had become very strategic in the fact of hanging out late on Thursdays, Fridays, Saturday, and Sunday nights. Getting home very early in the morning. So to get up to go to a tryout was not something that I thought I could do. And then I heard this voice that said, get up. Get up, girl, you are worthy. Get up, girl, you got this. Get up, girl, go do this, what everyone said you can't. Get up, girl, you can do this. So I got up, I went to those tryouts. And all of a sudden I discovered this very strong woman that I apparently never unleashed. And we introduced ourselves to each other that day at football tryouts and I, she's my best friend today. So I walk in that walk. And, and my job today is to encourage other people, to empower other people, to fulfill their dreams. Sometimes you have dreams that you don't even know. But life has a way of shifting. So when I became a football player, I wasn't the greatest player on the team. I was the old chick on the team, 42 years old with a bunch of 20-year-olds and I had to get to the ball faster than them. Not happening, right? It wasn't happening. But so I had to be very strategic and I had to think about things and, and, and watch film and study our opponents. Well, who's my opponent? My opponent, I'd say, is the world. Acceptance is what I seek. Non-discrimination is what I seek. Equality is what I seek. And sports has given me that. So to go full circle with playing football at a late age in life, to be the very first black woman to coach in the history of the National Football League is something that I cherish, but I know that that platform is something to be utilized to empower the next generation. Coaching with the New York Jets back in 2017 was very exciting to say the least. But it was also very scary because as confident as I became at the age of 42 as a rookie on a football team, that's an oxymoron, all of a sudden I became very insecure. So going there, I remember driving there in my car, my convertible, top down, luggage in the back seat, drove to New York Jets training camp. And then as I got closer, I was like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And then I was like, yes, I do. No, you don't. Yes, you do. And so it was a battle, but it was a battle that I had to find out for myself because 
Our hardships show us exactly who we are. And I have to say, the destiny in me is greater than the storm around me. And that is applicable to everybody here and what you can pass on to somebody else to let them know that they are worthy, that they are valued. Sports can make you greater than you already are. So be the leader that you would follow. Thank you very much. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Colette. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now two more videos by Christopher Phillips and Emma Witkowski. I'm a historian of science, but I got interested in baseball because it laid bare some of the tensions at the heart of how we know things reliably in the modern world. Take the case of scouting. It's the term used to refer to the managers and front office executives on baseball teams who, to be blunt, are charged with deciding on the worth of players, putting a dollar sign on the muscle, as they say. And at first glance, treating bodies as commodities seems crude at best and reminiscent of chattel slavery at worst. And indeed, black bodies and old bodies and disabled bodies were devalued in baseball. But we try to make value judgments about things that are hard to value all the time. What surgeon should I have operate on me? Is my child's teacher any good? How much is this bottle of wine actually worth? Put in economic terms, bodies are singularities, which makes them incredibly difficult to value. This is particularly the case in sports where you're often not valuing past performance of a player, but the future performance of a player. There's a simplistic story that we sometimes tell ourselves that we can get rid of our biases or faulty intuitions simply by collecting more data and analyzing them. The problem is that it doesn't really work like this in practice. There's just no stark divide between objective numbers and subjective judgments. All numbers are collected by people, are understood and preserved by people, and have baked into them the assumptions that people bring to the table. This, I want to suggest, is the case for much of the modern world. Data science, algorithmic processing of big data, artificial intelligence, whatever we're calling these things now, they can only get us so far when we're dealing with humans. Uncertainty, contingency, chance, every frustrated baseball fan or front office executive knows how hard it is to predict the future. Part of what team sports teach us is that we might simply want to embrace this uncertainty and not be pulled in by the lure that the right data or the right analyst will make our knowledge completely reliable. I'm going to pitch you something. Esports teams are just sports teams. At their core, teams have these common essences. They produce intercorporeal attentions within a group or inter embodiments, which is bodily entanglements between people. Within team sports, this type of attention affects how you anticipate yourself to be seen and you adjust to your teammates' needs. Inter embodiment affects how you know and reflect your teammates' uh, abilities as they move through game space. And this is often learned by spending incredibly boring practice time together, dribble drills on a basketball court, or fine tuning your healing rotations in League of Legends. Sports teams become deeply attuned to their active humans. And this type of inter embodied experience happens without even seeing your teammates in action. They know where you are or where you should be in a zone defense. You're part of a beautiful tactic and transformation taking place somewhere completely different on a game map. And you're a participant in something more than your own body as inter-embodied perception is produced both within your team and alongside of your opponents as they move in response play by play, whether those bodies are represented in pixels or in person. But esports teams are also not legacy or terrestrial sports teams just yet. Terrestrial team sports are entrenched in segregated systems of participation across sex, gender diversity, and body ability. These systems become more prevalent as we move up the pipeline into elite play, and we get to peek into those cultures that govern these economically and socially lucrative institutions. So can esports change these worlds of play? Maybe not, given corporate backdrops and ownership structures over who owns a playing field and what sells or what captures the most eyeballs online. But also maybe, maybe let's give esports just enough wiggle room to see their participants shake up what we think we know about team sports by how players make sense of their game, 
as they play them in. In this maybe space, we already see women holding world championship titles in open division tournaments and coaching international men's teams. We already see cis, queer and transgender women lifting each other's game as they play well together on mega sports stages like the Commonwealth Games in esports tournaments without tournament officials body policing those who worked so hard to get there. Esports has team sports potential to offer more fluidity and to challenge some of the rules we humans consistently put into play around team sports. But this is also a big team effort. It's a structural effort and it's a social one. But here, more exciting team forms could be produced. Not just because we can play together in out of space or as dragons, but the big potential is more basic. It's about how we meet other bodies through team play and how we get to see ourselves by how we do team sports well together. Well, I'm always stunned by the brilliance of so many scholars and thinkers and just people all over the world. And I'm, I have to thank Christina for gathering them all here in body and in, as dragons. <laughs> anyway, uh, last but not least, and as we say in Italy, the dessert comes at the end, is Gabriele Fontana, who actually gave me the idea for this whole salon when I met him. Gabrielle is a, a, a designer, an independent designer, who has a very personal take on uh, the idea of sports and of physical education, because his dad was a PE teacher, actually. And I want you to hear from him why I was so entranced when I met him. Gabrielle Fontana, please come. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Paola. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So my name is Gabrielle Fontana. And as you can hear from my accent, I'm French. <laughs> I cannot hide it. <laughs> And so I'm based in Paris, and I work as an independent designer. And my work is centered around the intriguing challenge of redesigning team sports. And here I'm not talking about redesigning team sports only from an aesthetical or athletic perspective, but also from a social perspective, which means for me, investigating how sports can be reimagined to be more inclusive, reflective and transformative. So let's delve into that journey. So first of all, I think it's interesting that if we look at history, what we can see is that sport has not really moved on since the first modern Olympic Games in 1896. And therefore, I do believe that team sport games still carry conservative social values from this very old time. And you know, on the other hand, our society has experienced constant social changes, evolutions, revolutions, and therefore this brings the questions, why are we actually still playing the same games since all these times? But also more importantly, how can we make sport practices evolve to support societal changes and respond to the needs of the new generation? So for three years, I developed a research for the city of Rotterdam in the Netherlands, where I collaborated with secondary schools, and together we investigated how we could make the physical education class more inclusive for kids. And so through this collaboration with schools, I came to realize that many kids still experience the sports class as a very hostile and unsafe environment. I don't know what was your experience of PE uh, when you were younger, but yeah, it's a place of trauma for many kids. <laughs> and indeed, like diverse research shows that overweight children, children with disabilities, uh, queer kids and girls in general, tend to feel excluded, bullied, and marginalized in many ways in PE. And this kind of uh, dynamic of exclusions are often crystallized, for example, during the team building process, you know, where you always have some team, team leaders who's always going to pick up um, their teammates, and you always have some kids who end up to be the last one to be picked up, and that are left on the side, whether to do due to their gender, body shape, sexuality, or popularity in the class. And so, in response to this, 
I developed together with the schools an alternative team sport games that deconstructs group dynamics and promotes empathy. The game is called Multiform, and I will show you now the video. So Multiform is a game that is played in a three-team format, already in the idea of like challenging the binary system of sport, where usually it's always one team against another one. And what is interesting but with this idea of adding a third team to a game is that basically it's open space for collaboration, because two teams can decide to team up against the other one, but this situation can change as well. And in addition to this, I designed for this game a transformable sport uniform that changes color through the games and therefore invites the players to constantly change teams. Yes. <laughs> so the game starts with three equal teams, the white team, dark blue team, and light blue team. It's basically, yeah, a, a ball game. And what I do then is that I use the outfit as a tool to come to deconstruct the traditional notion of stable team. So here we're going to see the first transformation happening. All the players first are reversing the top part of their t-shirt, and they are all relocated in a new team. So it's always the last colors that appear on your outfit that define your team. So now the light blue team is defined with the light blue t-shirt. And so this transformation happens a few times during the games, meaning that your body becomes a real color patchwork, overlapping the different color teams, going from a uniform to a multiform, which is the name of the game. But it's also to become very confusing for people to understand in which teams are, as you can see. They're like, are we still playing together? No, I'm not sure. And then, like, again, a new team. Uh, has been formed. <laughs> and so for me, it was also this idea of thinking of how sport can be not only a physical activity, but more like a reflective one as well. Because here in the game, you const constantly have to question yourself to which team do you belong to, and what is your role within this group. And what we can see here is that it's not only the composition of the team that change, but also the size of the groups that also like, yeah, become different. So this means that you can go from playing in a very big group opposed to like two smaller groups, or the other way around, sometimes like end up in a very small team. And in this way, like the game also gives you a very tangible understanding of uh, what does that mean to play as a minority in the game, how does it feel, uh, but also like how you might need to adapt or change your strategy as well in the game. And so the game stimulates empathy by allowing players to relate to various people, teams, and worlds at different times during the game. You know, when we talk about empathy, we talk about our ability to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else where here in the game, you are literally wearing the clothes of your opponent at one point. And so after playing the games, children discuss collectively how the games deconstruct the traditional notion of what a team is. And we reflect together on what does it mean to belong to a group, how do we relate to the other, or what creates a community. And so I position this game as a form of queer pedagogy in the way that the game teaches us how to deal with more than a binary experience of the world. And in addition, by allowing people to take on multiple and fluid identities, the game opens up spaces for experimentation, play, and collective reflection that challenge fixed categories. In conclusion, the Multiform Project makes a case for how the body can play a role in the development of reflective capacities, empowerment, and inclusiveness in school context and beyond. Thank you. So now I, I would like to invite you, invite you all to sit with me. Please come. And Bobito is hovering above. Yeah, here you are, Bobito. Not so great. Perfect. Come, come, Simon. So Bobito, I want to start. I want to start by asking you a question. 
in uh, outdoor basketball, what makes a good team player? Because, you know, we always get asked, you know, you're, are you a good team player? So what's a good team player? <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's a great question, um, and it could be asked. I mean, that could be answered in a hundred different ways. I mean, you know, everyone has a, a, a role to contribute. You know, I, I think um, I think of a, a, a guy named Wave, who I grew up with, who never shot the ball. All he did was pass, <laughs> and everyone picked him for their squad. He was he was probably about 240 pounds, maybe 250 pounds. He was heavier than most players. He wasn't particularly tall, didn't jump very high. You know, and we grew up at, at the GOAT, a.k.a. Rocksteady Park, with legendary in both hip-hop and basketball. Why was this uh, player who wouldn't fit the stereotype of, of a popular athlete, right, always picked? But be, it's because he knew how to set the table. He knew how to pass the ball, distribute. He was positive. He, he would reinforce players that were a little fearful and uh, or, you know, hesitant. And he was just a leader on the court. And so, you know, the, the, the ideal player outdoors can take many, many shapes. Um, and, you know, ultimately it's the spontaneity uh, that, that wins. You know, it's uh, you have five people, or maybe you have three people, or two people, whatever the team is. Uh, you got to figure out how to stay on top uh, and enjoy yourself by the end of the game. Um, and so sometimes it's it's the players who it's can perform jazz on the asphalt, and that's why those same players do so well when they get an organized context when they can figure out how to play within the X's and O's because they have that creativity already embedded. It's baked in their system. So that's and that's why New York move. City is, is considered the mecca of the sport because we have been producing players like that okay. since the 1910s, 1920s. So it's not an informal sport, uh, outdoor, outdoor basketball at all. I mean, there's like, uh, there's a natural pro progression to so-called professional or organized basketball? Well, I mean, it is um, informal outside in that, I mean, anybody can walk up. Uh, you might have a visitor from, I mean, I've played against people from Poland, from Osaka, Japan, from Johannesburg, all in New York. I mean, I could name 50, 60 countries that are represented it on the courts, Bangladesh, I mean, on and on and on. I mean, it's, there's, it is informal. But there is a pathway to elite levels from the playground. It doesn't happen very often. Uh, the first instance that I can think of is Harthorn Wingo, who was uh, not a stellar college basketball player, but came up to New York from South Carolina in the early 70s, splashed at Rucker Park, made so much noise there, became such a, a crowd favorite that the New York Knicks wound up giving him a contract. And he won an NBA championship strictly based on his exploits mm -hmm. uptown. Um, that doesn't happen often because the you know in 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 that world it's it's a it's a very formal. They, they want the college star that already has branding and following and you know, but it it, it can it happen. Can happen. It, it right. can happen. What is interesting in this, um, in this panel is also we're straddling different sports. And uh, I would like to ask the same question of Tracy right now, because also there's a fine line between uh, exploitation and abuse and being called a teammate, you know, a good team player in, in, in football. So um, what is that fine line and how does it manifest itself? I mean, have you seen it being used, that term, to coerce people? To coerce people, oh, for sure, right? Because mm -hmm. the idea is that you want people to come together as a team and you want them to come together on the field. And so it's something that's manipulated often. Um, and I would say that it's manipulated by the coaches, it's manipulated by the universities. Um, I think that something that's very particular about the space that I work in is that it's college, right? And so these are um, allegedly student athletes. I don't use that term in my work because I think that it's a fallacy. I don't, I don't believe that that's exactly what's going on. 
Um, but because they're in college, there's something very particular about the fact that they're uncompensated. And so if you look at the amount of time that's invested in their sport, and this applies to all sport in college, but I just write about football. But if you look at the amount of time that's invested in their sport, if you would look at um, what the rules, and compare that to what the NCAA says that they are doing, for example, right? Like the NCAA rules are that you are only working on your sport for 20 hours a week. And if I ask the students that end up in my classes to tally the amount of time that they're working on their sport, it's way more than 20 hours. And it's only because the NCAA uses certain things for that tally. Um, so that's like one weird disconnect, right? That is they're following the rules, but they're not actually, um, they're following the rules that are in place, but they're not actually doing what the rules say. Um, yeah, they're not being enforced um, because they need them to buy into this idea that they are working on behalf of a team, that they want to be productive for the team. They want to win for the other people that are out there putting on the same uniform, working together. Um, and so there's a lot that happens from the top down, but the work that I do is also from the bottom up, right? Like if there are people on a team who call each other teammate, they take that seriously, and I frame it as them calling themselves brothers, because they work on behalf of their brothers, right? So like they, I've come across several people in my work who don't like football anymore because of the way that it is um, commercialized in college, right? Like it was something that they did for fun and then they got to college and they're like, oh, this is not it anymore. I know I'm not gonna make it to the NFL because if you look at the stats for that, they're abysmal, the number of players that go from college to the NFL, I think it's about 2% are drafted. 2%. Um, 2%. <laughs> um, so if you, if you know that most of them are not gonna go, but you see them all playing on Saturday, right? Like if you watch college football like I do, because I still watch it, um, most of them are not gonna go to the NFL. So what is convincing them to be out there? Because something has to be, it's not money, um, and it's not making it pro, because most of them won't. And so I argue that it's usually the, the relationship that they form with each other. And so they are doing something completely different than what the coaches and the teams are trying to do um, because they realize that they are there for each other and they're trying to help each other win. And I think that that's a little bit different or very different actually than what, than what universities and coaches are trying to do. Wow, super interesting. It's a really strong bond. Yeah. And uh, Gabrielle, what makes a good team player in your game? Good question. <laughs> yeah, it's like the opposite, right? It's being completely like unattached. I mean, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I would say like uh, our ability to adapt ourselves to like a new situation that's like constantly changing. You know, I like to say that uh, when I started to work with the schools, I didn't really know what would be a good age to like introduce the game. And my first assumptions was that the game would be too complicated for the kids. And actually I realized that it's always easier for kids to play than for adults. Yep. Well, because basically, I mean, like, first of all, with the kids, you don't need to explain for hours. You can just, like, throw the ball, <laughs> and they will, like, learn how to play by playing, basically. Where when I give workshops with adults, it always takes ages to start because people want to make sure that they understood properly what they sign up for. <laughs> but also, kids uh, get way more confused or, like, disoriented by this, like, constant change of color and teams because they're just, like, super quick. Uh, and I find it like, quite fascinating, you know, like from which moment in our life do we lose this ability for being so fluid huh. in many ways. And I think also like show how this idea of like belonging to like one specific team and like staying within this group is also like a learned behavior because the kids didn't internalize, you know, this as like an adult uh, did. So they're like way more open for like yeah, other social structures uh, to perform and play within. Um, and now I want to ask Colette and Simon uh, something else. You know, before Bobito was saying that there's no coach in outdoor basketball. So what makes a good coach, Colette? I, I mean, <laughs> what makes a, a, a great coach? Because I don't know about good coaching. Okay. okay. Right? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> of course you don't. <laughs> Uh, what makes a of great course. coach is um, someone that is in tune with each of their players. You know, uh, player A may not respond to me yelling at them, right? Player B does, right? So I'm going to give it to player B, right? That's easy to do. Player A, what do they need? So it's about you understanding what your players need to fit that common goal. The end goal is to win, Right? And so, and then it's a sense of family. I mean, literally when I started playing football, uh, it was because I wanted brotherhood, I wanted sisterhood, I wanted community. I wanted to be with people. I wanted to cry with them at the movie. 
and, or, or laugh at the movie, right? Like the parts in the scene. And so that is applicable from children all the way through adulthood. So when I was coaching in the NFL with the New York Jets, you know, a lot of people might ask me, you know, how many of them did you wrong or treated you wrong? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, tell us all the horror stories. And I'm like, I don't have any. Because when you know what you're doing, you earn the respect, you gain that respect, and then they treat you as such. But players need a sense of community, humanity, and humaneness. And then, of course, the knowledge. Yeah. Simon? Uh, Simon, I mean, let's forget Berlusconi. Forget it. I mean, <laughs> let's talk about Arrighetto. Let's talk about Arrigo uh, Yeah. Yeah, or if you have... You did, I was so touched that you talked about that particular moment in Milan's story. It, it was an extraordinary moment. I mean, because it it's beautiful. It was yeah. so beautiful. I mean, <laughs> great. I mean, oh, there was a documentary came out last week, uh, Beckham. Oh yeah. I hate Manchester United. <laughs> uh, I hate Milan. I really hate Milan. Uh, wow. But I hate Manchester United with a <laughs> deep intensity. And uh, <laughs> and so a question I've got to to Gabriel is, is you know. The, at the core of team sports is enmity, right? There's this real sense in which you hate the opposing team. You don't want to kill them. You don't want. You just want to, you just want to win. You want to beat them, and uh, and you want your team to win. So there is that. Now, a great coach. You watch the Beckham documentary, uh, and you see Beckham as a young boy, and his dad was a Manchester United fan, and his dad gets him to a position where he, you know, goes to trials, and then he is introduced to Sir Alec Ferguson. Alec Ferguson becomes his coach. And Ferguson was a tyrant, you know? Ferguson was someone that could shape young, young boys and uh, form a team in different ways. And uh, Beckham, you think of as the supreme kind of individualist celebrity footballer, he submitted to that for the sake of the team that he loved, his father loved, and a team that were formed in the mind of Alec Ferguson in order to knock Liverpool off their perch. So this, this, is, where, this is where the multi-form, the multi is it's fantastic, that. I would love to have played that uh, as a kid. And I remember just the, I mean, the, well, I think what we forget as we get older is just the, the sheer joy of play, right? What it is just to play is just so much fun running, you know? But if you think about human history, um, Oh, I don't know. Think about, there's a book by Prodicus called The Secret History of Constantinople. We're in the 8th century, the era of Justinian. And the, in Constantinople, I mean, everybody was trying to destroy the Byzantines because they had power. But inside that city, there were two teams called the Reds and the Blues. And they fought, it was competitive sport. Like in Siena. In Siena, yeah. I was thinking in Siena, Siena, yeah, So like there's something blogging. about you can be together. Yeah. We are, I mean, the Greeks, I mean, the, the, the people of Constantinople thought of themselves as, uh, as Romanoid. They were Romans, right? But more importantly, they were reds or blues. Yeah. And, that, and what's interesting about, I think it's about sport, about team sport that fascinates me is the experience of rivalry. Of enmity, and you want, and you, but it, 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 and I, I see. I think it's, I think it's, it's like, it's like polytheism religiously, right? I have my gods, my team, my place, my tribe, my history, and the Milanese have their gods, their history, and it's fine. I don't want my gods to be their gods. Why should there be one God? Well, there could be loads of gods. So, but your team, but your your the sense in which you can you believe in that that structure, those gods, those myths, those are your heroes. And the rivalry, the enmity, which does not result in and there's violence here, right? Let's deal with the question of violence. I and, hope so. And and human no. beings. <laughs> And we are, we're, we're violent creatures. That, uh, uh, but, but, but sport is a way of doing a kind of a symbolic violence. It can, it, it can no, tip over course. into terrible things. Tonight there was a Belgium-Sweden game which was, uh, which was, was abandoned at halftime because there was uh, two Swedes were, were killed in, in Brussels today. 
Um, so, and it's unclear why that is. It might be related to to the game, the Quran burnings in. Yeah. How about wow. the game? How about wow. that? The right. game, no, the game. I like the fact that instead, yeah. um, Gabriel's and Bobito's game seems to be godless. Right? There's no gods there. There's just the game. It's interesting. So, um, one one question again for me, and then I'll open it to the audience. But Bobito. Um, what does um, what are the dynamics of these informal teams? So, what does public basketball tell us about how humans come together? Are there people that are excluded? Like I, I was the kid on the bench because I was overweight. Oh, does it happen? Totally. Uh, does it happen in public basketball? Absolutely. I mean, there there are moments of exclusion, and there's amazing passages of inclusivity. Um, and uh, I think uh, in New York, for example, there are a great number of women who play. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't the same amount of women who play on public courts as there are men. Um, and so what, what has happened in the last like 10, 15 years is that a lot of women have been bonding and creating all women runs. Um, and that's not something that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s that I was aware of at least. But um, you know, we're seeing it more and more. Um, but I mean, there's certainly some grumpy old dudes out just, you know, just like uh uh the last speaker was saying, you know, it's it's sometimes it's easier to teach the kids <laughs> than to the adults. There's certainly some old weekend warriors out there that, you know. Don't play during a week. They're out of shape. They just want to argue because they need a break because they're out of breath. And That's uh, good. you know, That's good. <laughs> they're not fun to play with. You know, I, I I have traveled throughout the five boroughs when I did my my documentary uh, doing it in the park pickup basketball NYC. I went to 180 courts in 75 days, and I can tell you that the majority of the joy out there is is in the teenage population and in, and in the early 20s. Yeah. I, can, I can also tell you that there are more Spanish speakers in New York than there are English. Well, I, which, I, we know that. <laughs> well, well, I'm saying on the court. On the courts too, yeah. Surprises yes. a lot of people. Um, yeah. And so there's a lot of dynamics that that occur and it's, it's, it's too heavy and too complex, um, but no, we should you watch know, your movie so we know where to go, and we should. It's how, I highly yeah. recommend yeah. you want to get a sense. I know of you do. I highly <laughs> recommend it too. So, questions from the audience. Okay, we have Alphonse there to begin, and then I'm not going to point at people anymore, and then I'm, I'm going to let Christina and Bruno do their thing. So, That's... Alphonse, you're the last one I look at. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everyone. The mic works. Um, it's a really lovely presentation. Thank you so much, Paula and team, for convening, as always, and to everyone for speaking. And, you know, it's like a pep talk. I have a question that talks about kind of this two interrelated um, notions. The first I want to ask about is the idea of agency, of participation and non-participations and break ways from participation, particularly when we think of team sports and organized athletics as an industrial complex as, they, as it is now, especially in the States. And I guess this question is directed towards um, Tracy and Colette, you know, in how, maybe in your experiences, how have you negotiated or observed, you know, displays of agency in being able to resist certain hegemonic powers and, and forces and kind of... No, I'll stop here because otherwise it becomes too complex. This is a good question. Then, okay, yeah, Is that okay? Yeah. Not, yes, it's a... Yeah, the it, question is yeah, clear. It's a, it's a, yeah, right? Mentive. I can pass it back. I can pass it back. <laughs> the other one's about scale. <laughs> sc about scale? Okay, we'll get there. But no, I think that this is... Mm -mm, yeah. Sure, I can take that. It's Thank a you good one. I didn't want to, but to <laughs> It's a great question it. um, yeah. because I get it a lot, right? Like the agency is something that's interesting when you're talking about people that are being exploited, right? Like I argue that college athletes are being exploited. So why do they participate? Um, 
And so I think that I've, I've touched on a couple of reasons why I think that they do and why they still do it. And then they realize, and part of it too is why they, I... well, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they also realize that there's an end, like there's a there's an end point, right? Like because if they're not going to go pro, then they know that once they graduate, once they have their season, their senior season, it's all going to end. Um, but just examples of of ways that they do resist, I can think of a player specifically who um, consistently had injuries his first two years on the on the team that he was on. They were knee injuries, um, and that's common for the position that he played. Um, and at a certain point, he was like, I'm just, I'm, I'm done. Like, I'm over this, right? Like, I know I'm not going to go pro. I know that my body cannot sustain this type of work day in and day out. I will consistently get hurt. And so he retired, right? So he became a retired college coach or a, a retired college player, excuse me, um, in his third year of college. And also with that decision, like realized that he would probably lose a scholarship because of the way that scholarships yeah. work in college. And so he had to make that decision of like, am I going to decide that my body, like the body that I have now, the only body that I have um, is worth me not doing this anymore, especially because I cannot sustain this type of labor. And so to me, those examples, right? Like there's plenty of examples like that where they do take back some of their power. Um, often they do lose something, but they imagine it as gaining a lot more. And for him, it was like, now I can walk, right? Like, he's five years out of college. He can walk without a cane, which is something that potentially would not have happened if he did not stop playing. And so there's moments like that that I think, especially when it's tied to injury for the sport that I work with, um, about the ways that players are taking back their agency, right? Like, and, and displaying resistance. I, I, on the other hand, am the complete opposite. <laughs> I, I as, a, as a woman that started playing pro football at the age of 42, I had something to prove. Yeah. How dare you? keep me from this beautiful sport. How dare you? And so I underwent double knee surgery my rookie year, and I rehabbed quickly. I told my doctor, do both knees. He goes, no, we do one at a time. And I said, no, you're not. You're going to do both knees. I'm not getting any younger here. You know, you told me it's, it'll take about a year to rehab one knee and then the other year, I'm like, dude, I'm now I, 43. I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh-uh. So I had them both done and I, you know, I was crawling around my apartment on my hardwood floors like commando, dragging my body around. And then I was rehabbing when I could because I had the urgency to not be denied anymore. Like being denied something that you want to do based on gender, religion, uh, whatever it may be. It's not cool, right? So I'm just taking my power back, and I'm going to show you. And it was fun, and I loved it, right? So it was also a love of the sport, you know? And, and, and then we speak about, like, my, my brother I had a brother that played football when we were children, and, and I called him um, Splinter Bottom because back then we had wooden benches. You know, today they're metal, but he rode the bench, you know, and I'm thinking if I played, I wouldn't be riding the bench. I'd be on the field. But I had something to prove. So I was going to do whatever I had to do to get on that field. To get there. <laughs> Next. Christina decides. It's her one. <laughs> I'm curious to hear your thoughts on fans and spectators. Oh, yeah. Uh, the oh, yeah. audience that's that kind of takes Simon. us from practice to the game. And do you need those fans in order to make it a team sport? Simon. Uh, football without fans is nothing. Mm -hmm. Example or proof, COVID, right? Uh, when, say, uh, the European leagues resumed without fans. <coughs> and oh, it was, it was the, so weird. Yeah, and you could hear the players talking to each other. Uh, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, or, you know, whatever. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a Nietzschean as such. But I think the, the distinction between the Apollinian and the Dionysian in Nietzsche makes sense in relationship to soccer, in the sense in which you've got these individuals on the pitch, uh, you know, working as a team, and then you have this Dionysian womb of being, this intoxicated crowd which is, which is producing effects on the pitch. That's the extraordinary thing about... Uh, about the game that I love, soccer, is there is such a there's a genuinely such a thing as home advantage. So if you're playing in the San Siro, which is shared by two teams, if you're playing in the San Siro, you feel it. It's terrifying. 
Playing at Anfield, if you're opposing team, is terrifying. The fans can have that effect. And also the fans can inform what's happening on the pitch, reflect it, comment on it. And there's a constant uh, back and forth. And there's a wonderful, wonderful film uh, from 2005 uh, by Philippe Pareno and uh, Douglas Gordon called Zidane. Oh, yeah, the movie about Zidane. Zizou. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, Zizou. Zizou. Mm -mm. Uh, you know, the, the god. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's a commentary that Zidane gives. You know, uh, he doesn't, Zidane, he doesn't, Zidane didn't say very much. But what he said was very clear. And he said, you know, when you're playing, he was playing at that point for Real Madrid, he could hear everything that was happening. He could hear the fans. He could hear what was being said. It was as if his, his senses were, were heightened. heightened. So the fans... That's the strange thing. That's the one of the and I, to go back to the question of agency, I think the, the what what Tracy and Colette says is very very important. But also, I mean, there's this uh, one of the video things early on about the ball. Oh yeah. Right, mm. and Michel Serre. Okay, the quasi object, all that interesting stuff. The the the, the really extraordinary thing about uh, sports, team sports, is the there are individuals that have life, but also the ball is alive. The whole thing is alive. So we think, yeah, you know, we read books on, I don't know, Amerindian cosmology. We read books about, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the worldviews of the of ancient peoples, and we kind of wonder what would it have been like to live in an entirely animistic universe where everything was alive? Because we live in a modern world which is everything is dead. But I would say that in team sports, we begin to inhabit that kind of animistic universe where the agency is networked and distributed, right? And the, the players are part of that, but the ball is part of that, the stadium is part of that, and the, the fans, lights, the yeah. fans. And it's that, and at that point in a, in a game, it's, it, 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 it's, it's a cosmos. It's, it's a electric. living cosmos. Yeah. It's electric. It's electric. <laughs> it's, it's absolutely electric, so the first time that I got on the football field as the very first game that I played in, I got to hold my football helmet, have on my jersey, yeah. walk through that tunnel, modest that it was, um, <laughs> and, and know that I was about to beat the Pittsburgh passion and that my parents were in the stands mm -hmm. and that I'm doing this yeah. was electric Absolutely. and it didn't matter what field I was on. This was a big deal, right? And, 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 it's, and then the thing with women and women football, yeah. we didn't have fans come out to our games, right? So like, <laughs> there was a guy that might walk his dog and he'd see a game going on and he'd come in with his dog. <laughs> and we were like, look, there's somebody watching us, right? <laughs> but, but it was more about the glory of the sweat and the effort and the time and the sacrifice that we put into it, you know? And, I, and I, I ask, I ask a question of NFL players. If you didn't get paid to play this game, would you be watching, would we be allowed to watch football games on Sundays, Monday night football on Thursdays? The answer is no, they wouldn't be playing. You probably have less than half the team out there. Women in football, we just we do it. We have to pay to play. But all that being said, <laughs> we had to pay to play. Literally, I had to buy my helmet, my jersey, away and home. I'm like, can't we just wear the same jersey home and away? Like, revert. Maybe we needed you to reverse it for us. You know, I don't know. But because it was money, we had to pay for these two jerseys, right? But we did it because we love the sport and we love the. The, the, the feeling of feeling alive. Sports has a way of, of making you live out loud, right? And then it's a way of challenging yourself. Like, let's challenge yourself. Am I gonna wake up and just do, okay, I was told to go to school, graduate, go to here, get a job, or am I gonna live? You know, and sports has a way of doing that for you, right? So if you think about it, and I wasn't the greatest player on the football team. I was not, I mean, I was the old chick on the team, but I tried my very best. The whole point is that it, 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 it lit me up to think about what can I do in my career to be a better real estate broker? Let me challenge my boss today about these things, these three things I wanted to ask him for three years that I never did. Now I'm gonna ask him, <laughs> right? So uh, yeah, I digress.
Hello. Uh, this is such a rich, fascinating conversation. It's very, there's a lot of great perspectives at play. Um, I find especially interesting this kind of conflict between uh, Professor Tracy's coming to bat for the abuse and exploitation of certain players and Coach Colette representing the richness of the values of sport <laughs> and meritocracy. And I think part of what makes the exploitation of players so... Put your so hand up so we can see where... You see, yeah, oh, there you are. Hi, hi, hi. Hey, how you doing? I do have a question. Yeah, so, yeah. so my question is basically, how do you see the value of meritocracy and self-sacrifice? Because meritocracy is a word that didn't come up, I don't think, but it's such an important part of sports. So where does that sit, I guess, from a philosophical perspective, academic perspective, okay. as bringing value? All right, so who wants to take it? Mm -mm. Yeah, I don't oh, think, mm -hmm. sure, I don't think that sports are meritocracy. <laughs> um, and and I, would, I would argue against that heavily. I think that they are meant to, they're meant to be thought of as a meritocracy, right? Like there's a lot that's built into sports so that we buy into this idea. If you, if you can't tell, like I think that sports tell us a lot that we, there, there's a lot of narratives in sport that we then buy into, right? And I think that it does a really good job of packaging itself. I think the NFL is actually like the best at packaging itself in a particular way to then have people buy into it and watch and forget about a lot of the messed up stuff that's happening all the time. Um, but yeah, I don't think that sports are meritocracy, and I think that um, there's a lot that goes into this idea that it, it's not fair play, right? Like it's not anyone who just works hard enough can make it, right? Because race and sexuality and gender, all of religion, all of these things come into it. Resources, access, all of these things limit, include, or exclude um, people from participating, and so there's no way that it's actually this um, this just like playful thing that we want it to be, right? But it does a really good job of convincing us that it is. And so once you break it apart, then you notice that there's plenty of cracks in the foundation and allow for that to be broken apart. It's just whether or not we want to buy into that narrative or if we are just wanting to trust this meritocracy idea. Do you, do you want to see it? Yeah. Right? I'm going to be blind to this and enjoy the sport, enjoy the game. Yeah. You know, but I, I believe that once I got involved in football on a from, a, from being a, 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 an athlete, a, a football player, and then begging the NFL to support women's pro football, I was very hurt. I was like, oh my God, it's my, this, the NFL, I love the NFL. I, I have to dislike them now? I, I have to challenge them? I'm only one person, it's the NFL. But I, but I challenged them every chance I got because it's, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong. You know, I, you want to be right or you just want to sit back and just let it pass you by. Challenge. I believe in challenging, right? I mean, I don't, I don't ever want to see the kid that sits on the sideline, you know, sorry, you know, that you sat that in <laughs> gym class. I want everybody involved, right? Because we're going to find a way for you to fit in. And, and, and the beauty of like football for me, I, I mean, I'm in love with football, if you can't tell. Right. <laughs> the beauty of football, especially when it comes to gender, like with women that we're, we're not supposed to play, but the beauty of it is that it takes all sizes and shapes to make a complete team, right? So you don't have to be tall and, and, and athletic looking and lean and run down. We need you short and stout, okay? So me, Bertha, come on over here. Always, baseball was always the funniest thing for me. Baseball? Well, yeah, they're like chubby guys. Right, and how are they, but they don't have to run for long, you know what I mean? You know, yeah. and in football we need, the, we need the short chubby girls, uh, or the, 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 the big chubby girls, right? And, and then the tall lean ones, and like so they're, every, body, every body type has a place in this sport. And so when I visit schools in the inner city, and I talk to the children about understanding the sport and like they're scared to play. No, don't be afraid to play because you're needed if you choose to be in this. So. Well, we've come to 8 o'clock. And you know that I am really draconian on stopping so that we can continue the conversation with the mediocre wine and the so-so snacks. <laughs> and Bobito, I'm so sorry you're not here to have our fabulous popcorn <laughs> and, and our Prosecco. I mean, we miss you really dearly. But Thank you for being with us. 
Thank, Thank you, you to this wonderful panel. Thank you, Christina, for the production. Thank yes, you to the video yeah. makers. They were fantastic. Yes. And thank you all for being here. So um, let's continue outside. And you know, and you know that there's going to be a lot to talk about. Thank you. Bobito, a big kiss. Thank you for no. no.